Good morning, everyone. You are probably wondering where my brother is, since he is on the schedule, to um, speak with me. Um, our family has had a few last-minute things come up. You might have noticed that my mother hasn't been here very much. Um, not that there's been very long in the retreat, but she has been dealing with a lot of health issues. Sorry, my computer is being weird. Um, She's been dealing with a lot of different health issues. She's actually had about three surgeries in the last couple of weeks um, to do with her ears and dental and several different things. And so she is here to some or greater or less extent, but she's not actually going to be able to speak this year. And so we came to that conclusion, I think it was on Sabbath while we were uh, traveling here. And so we realized that meant some new sermons. Well, what that ended up meaning in the long run was that I needed to write a sermon between Sabbath and today. So this sermon is not the most scripted sermon you will have ever heard in your life. But hopefully that means it's a little more real, a little more tangible to our lives, not something that is going to be coming out of a book, because it's certainly not that. It's something that is real in my life and that I believe is real in all of our lives, and that's why I'm going to be talking about it. The uh, title of this sermon is The Impossible Gospel. What is the gospel really? And I know what we're all, we all kind of hear the word gospel, and we can think, oh, what a complicated, fancy word, this must be some stereotypical Christian sermon. Well, it's not going to be, as you will find out uh, very, very quickly. The gospel, I want us to talk about what the gospel actually is. The gospel, it might be a complicated, so to speak, word, but it's actually about a very simple, very powerful topic that we're going to be talking about today. The gospel is meant to be good news about a God who would leave everything he had and come and save us because he loved us that much. That's what the gospel is in a nutshell. But see, the thing is that it has become something very different to that in a lot of our minds. If we really analyze ourselves and the people around us, we can see that more and more people are leaving the church. More and more people are slipping away from a relationship with God and slipping into the world and those thinking patterns. More of us than we'd like to admit aren't always 100% sure what we believe either. You know, sometimes people can ask, so what do you believe about such and such? And have you ever been like, um, uh, well, um, I know what the fundamental beliefs are, if that's what you're asking. No, what do you believe? That can be a different thing. And we're not always 100% sure what we believe if we're completely honest, especially for us as young people. Why is that? Why is it that sometimes we don't know for sure what we believe? Well, I'm going to talk about how this actually looks. And I'm going to start by something that might sound a little radical. And I'm going to read you a quote from Brad Pitt. Um, those of you who don't know who Brad Pitt is, he's an atheist. He does not believe in God at all. So, of course, I'm not endorsing what he's saying. But I want you to really think about what he says. He says, I was brought up being told that things were God's way. Everything that happens is the way that God wants it to be, and everything that happens is God's plan. I always had a lot of questions about the world. A big question to me was fairness. I didn't understand this idea of a God who says, you have to acknowledge me. You have to say that I'm the best, and then I'll give you eternal happiness. If you won't, then you don't get it. It seemed to me to be about ego. I can't see God operating from ego, so it made no sense to me. You know, I think the reason that some of us question whether or not we believe in God is because we get a warped idea of who God is and what the gospel really means. And so we find ourselves wondering, do I even believe that? Do I even really, at a heart level, believe what my parents believe and what my church believes? You know, we can, we can think that we believe it until we're in a crisis. You know, it's in a crisis where we start to define what we really believe. Because it's one thing to say, oh yeah, I believe this, this, and this. But when our life depends upon what we believe, or maybe not our physical life, but our, what can feel like our life depends on that, then we begin to question, what do I really believe? <laughs> There's a quote. And the other quote that I want to read you is from Mr. Bean. That's not his real name, but that's probably what most of us would know him by. 
He says, what is wrong with inciting intense dislike of a religion if the activities or teachings of that religion are so outrageous, irrational, or abusive of human rights that they deserve to be intensely disliked? I want you to think about that for a minute before you think, man alive, what is she up there talking about? Is there something wrong with disliking that kind of a religion? No. There's nothing wrong with disliking a religion that is doing all of those things that he has said. And here's the thing. We often are not sure about whether we really want anything to do with religion or not because we aren't really seeing religion for what it really is. Mr. Bean's right to dislike a religion that's abusive of human rights, but that's not the religion that God asks us to believe in. That's not what God asks us to say, I want you to have that. Who Brad Pitt and who Mr. Bean are saying, I don't think I want that God. I agree. I agree with them. I wouldn't want a God like what they're describing. But you think the thing is, that is not the God we serve. That is not the gospel we believe. Sometimes, though, before we can see who God really is and what the gospel really is, we have to look at what it's not. Because sometimes around us, we can see a whole lot more of what the gospel isn't than what it is. And that's where unbelief can come into our lives. Unbelief comes in when we see the gospel being portrayed as one thing that doesn't seem right and doesn't seem fair. And then we start to question, well, do I even want God anyway? The question isn't do we want God or not. It's who is God? Because when we really know who God is, it takes a, it takes a very hard heart to not want him at all. So the first thing that the gospel is not, the gospel is not legalism. And some of you are probably going to want to throw rotten tomatoes at me at various points in this sermon. Different ones view different points. That's okay. I don't care. God is not out to control us. The gospel is not about whether we wear skirts or pants. It's not about whether we eat two meals a day or three meals a day. It's not about whether we listen to this specific song or that specific song. That's not what the gospel is about. It's not about whether or not we exercise. It's not about whether or not we show up to Sabbath school on time. It's not about how perfectly we do life at home. The gospel isn't about those things. You know, we can look at these principles that are encouraged, principles that are important and should be part of our lives, but we look at them and we can make them the most important part of our religion. We can think that the more we do them, the holier we become, and we can look down on and shun other people who don't live to those exact same standards that we do. And maybe you've been turned off by that kind of religion. And I want to encourage you with something, because if you have been turned off by that, guess who else was turned off by that? Jesus. When Jesus came and he saw the Pharisees full of this legalistic religion, he was completely turned off by it. You know, the, the Pharisees were about pay this tax, don't do anything that can be perceived as work on the Sabbath. Now, I'm not at all advocating that we, shouldn't work on, that we should work on the Sabbath, but as we know, the Pharisees took it a little too far where they had to, like, count their steps and not go over a certain amount and things like that on the Sabbath because that would be considered work. They would actually strap the law to their forehead as a little box on their forehead because it says, you know, bind it to your forehead. And so they... You know, we're just like, okay, let's take that literally. Strap a little Ten Commandments to our forehead and then go about and live our lives as we want. They would wash their hands ceremoniously before meals and all of these things, but they had no idea what the gospel meant. They oppressed the ones who wanted Jesus and turned people off of religion because of these legalistic rules that they had. Was that the gospel being lived out in their lives? Absolutely not. And you know, the same thing happens today. It might not be the Pharisees, and it might not look exactly the same, but it's the same root. And Jesus doesn't like it any more today than he did back then. He doesn't like it when we get everything mixed up and think that it's all about how holy we can be instead of how holy he is. Jesus came to stand against that kind of religion. Another thing that the gospel is not, the gospel is not pride and lack of vulnerability. That's a big thing that, Oftentimes, we can convince ourselves that our holiness consists in making the rest of the world think we have it together. And we would hear that statement, and probably most of us would say, oh, no, I don't believe that. <laughs> but how many of us go to church and pretend we're perfect? Only me? No, we, we tend to have this idea that we have to look like we have everything together, everything figured out, and to share that we might have some hidden problems in our life is weakness. We put on a front at church, at family retreat. 
we can hide our own weakness. We can stuff them down because we don't want to dwell on, you know, our imperfections. We want to be out there saving the world, right? We can push away the melting love of Jesus because religion's about logic, not emotions, right? But the truth of the matter is that while we're putting on this front to the world that everything is great, everything is wonderful, and I'm a perfect little Christian, in secret we can be struggling with all kinds of things. If we're really honest, maybe we don't struggle with all of these things, but we can struggle with some of them. Impurity, pornography, anger, depression, self-abuse, cynicism, selfishness. But meanwhile, we have to put on this front of, oh yeah, I have this all together. Is that the gospel? Is that the way Jesus lived? You know, far too often we use religion as a mask, but instead it becomes a wall to separate us from the love that God wants to show us. I was at a conference about two weeks ago, and uh, my brother was filming this conference, and so I was listening to the sermons, and I was just being really blessed by sitting there and hearing other people speaking instead of, you know, having to prepare or be up front myself. And this, the first night that we got there, I was so blessed by the message the speaker gave. It was simple, but he was so vulnerable and so humble in the way that he was sharing. I, it wasn't so much what he said as it was the way that he said it and the way that he presented Jesus in the way he was living it out, even up front. And I commented to my brother about it as we were driving back to where we stayed that night, and I was like, tonight's sermon was really good. And he said, really? You should tell, and I'm not going to name the speaker, but you should tell such and such because he was so discouraged about that sermon. He felt like it was a total flop and a disaster. And he was like, I don't know how God could have blessed anyone through that. Well, that kind of reinforced in my mind even more the humility that I had seen through that sermon. And so I, I thanked the speaker. And But the thing that was most powerful to me in his sermon was not what he said, but the humility that he had. That's what the gospel is. The gospel isn't about putting up our pride about being better than someone else or that we have it all together. We don't have to claim that. And when we do, it turns people away. See, we live in a, well, one more thing. Um, One more thing the gospel is not. The gospel is not using the principles of God for our own good. Now, we know that, but I want us to really think about that. The human heart is desperately wicked. And we don't want to think that we could use God's principles for our own good, but it happens. Using Bible verses while missing the spirit of those verses to prove our point misrepresents who God really is. Picking up on the parts of the Bible we like to then bash other people over the head with those parts of the Bible because God said it is misrepresenting the gospel and misrepresenting to people who Jesus really is. That's not the gospel. All of those things that we have talked about, that's not who God is. That is not who the gospel is. And there's a whole lot of people who think that that is the gospel and that's why they don't believe. And we might say, oh, well, nobody here would struggle with that. But let's be real, guys. We do struggle with that. I'm going to be honest and say that I have struggled with that, even in the last year. When we, sometimes we can get confused by these things and we can think, I don't want that kind of gospel. What I want to encourage you with is Jesus says, I don't either. And that's not the gospel you have to believe in. Now, Some of you are probably thinking, oh, this is great. Is this going to be one of those sermons about God does everything and I do nothing? Well, no. See, the thing is, the gospel is misrepresented today in so many different ways. It's misrepresented in all the ways we just talked about. But sometimes the gospel is misrepresented in another way. And that is that God does absolutely everything. And all we have to do is say, I'm sorry, and he covers for us completely, and that's it right there and then. That's another misrepresentation of the gospel. Now, I think in circles like this, we're far more prone to fall into the legalism and the pride and all of that, and I'm speaking for myself as well, than to fall into the ditch of thinking that I don't have to do anything and God has to do all of it. But there are two ditches, and I'm not wanting us to come out of one and go into the other. Because we live in a world where it says forgiveness is everything, and then we can continue in sin. I want to read you another quote. Um, from Kiera Knightley. I don't actually know who that individual is, but this quote really struck me. She's an atheist. I know that much. She says, it's absolutely extraordinary. If only I wasn't an atheist, I could get away with absolutely everything. You just ask for forgiveness, and then you're forgiven. That should say something to us as Christians. That should say a lot to us. If the kind of religion we believe in is, I do what I want, I ask God to forgive me, and I carry on doing what I want, maybe we've missed the point just as much as if we have to pretend to the rest of the world that we're holier than them. 
You know, on first impression, we might think that a God who is all love and mercy and who lets us do whatever we want is a lot more appealing than a doom and gloom kind of God. But I want you to think about it. How would you feel if you were married and you were being unfaithful and your spouse knew about it and they could care less? They're like, fine, doesn't bother me. You go out, you do what you want with other people, you come back, doesn't bother me at all. I'm not talking about they're forgiving that person when they come back. They just don't care. Would that bother you if you were married to that person? Would you be like, you don't care at all? Like, there's no sacredness to this relationship in your mind? It's just, it doesn't matter? No, that would be wrong and that would bother us. And it's just the same with God. Do we really want a God who, can, who doesn't blink an eye when people shoot a bunch of kids at school? Do we really want a God who's fine with that? Do we want a God who doesn't mind when children are trafficked? Do we want a God who is okay with sin? We want a God who's okay with our sin, but not everybody else's sin. And that's not the gospel either. What if the gospel isn't any of these things that we talked about? What if it's something different than we have ever seen and ever experienced? Something magical, something beautiful, something miraculous. What if the gospel is powerful enough to make all of us who are broken whole? What if it's powerful enough to give the weak power to scale mountains? to use the most timid and self-condemning people to shake the world? What if it's so powerful that it raised people from the dead and so beautiful that people were willing to die because of it? What if that's the gospel? It's an impossible gospel, and that is what makes it beautiful. Far too often in, in our world today, we think beautiful means easy. It means, we think it in relationships, you know, there's a reason that so many people are afraid to commit to relationships because it's work, because it means committing, it means investing yourself. There's a reason that a lot of people don't get married and, you know, live the way that they do, because they're afraid of that commitment. But what makes the gospel beautiful is the fact that it is impossible, and yet it's a God who is so lovable that he makes even the impossible possible through this gospel. Because here's the thing. The gospel isn't about our skirt length or whether or not we're vegan. It's not about how good of a front we put on to the rest of the world. It's not about us having it all together. That's not the gospel. The gospel is about Jesus. It's about a man who says, I love you, and I'm not going to stop loving you ever, point blank, no matter how many times you leave me, no matter how many times you fail me. That's what the gospel is. It's about God saying, you may hate yourself, but I died thinking about you, and that was what gave me the strength to leave the nails in my hands and not jump down from the cross. That's what the gospel is about. It's about a friend, a friend named God, who says, you may have tried as hard as you know at this whole thing of Christianity and given up and fallen and failed every single time, but I'm not going to leave you, and I will not give up on you, and I will win in the end. That's what the gospel is about. If you want to know what the gospel is, look at Jesus. Who was Jesus when he came to earth? He was the man caring for people. He was the man seeking out the sick. He was the man listening. It says in Desire of Ages that when Jesus was a boy, he would often be known to give his lunch away to people that he would meet because they were hungry, or at least to give half of it away so that you know, he could sit there and he could eat with them. But he was constantly sharing. He was the listening ear for people when he was growing up. He was the one that people would go to. He came to touch the unclean, to make the rejected people his friends. And while he was doing that, he was telling off the ones who were high and mighty in their legalism that that was not what he was here to do. But Jesus didn't just come to get obedience. I think we tend to see Jesus the wrong way. We think, well, he just came to tell us to do this, and then we'll have it all together. Jesus didn't just come to get obedience. He didn't just come to fix people. He came to love people. He came to make them his friends. The world was in a horribly dark place when Jesus came. There had been no prophets, no light from God for about 400 years. That's a really long time. You know, we can think our world is wicked today, and it is very wicked, but it was wicked back then. And Jesus came into that, and he didn't come into that and just say, guys, get it together already. Like, where have you been? What have you been doing all of this time? He didn't do that. He chose disciples so that they could live with him, so that they could see his life, they could see his relationship 
with his father. He didn't even, and this is, this is a call to me uh, when we do traveling and speaking, Jesus didn't just come out for an hour and preach a sermon and then go back into his own little life. Jesus actually had his disciples living with him, seeing what it actually meant for him to be a Christian, eating with him, walking with him, traveling across the lake with him, doing all of these things with him. He was a God who wanted to be invested in every part of their lives and who let them be in in every part of his lives. He came to live in the middle of us so we could see the gospel in action. The gospel, it's not love. I mean, it's not legalism. It is love. It's not self-righteousness. It is selflessness. It's not pride. It's humility. It's not hypocrisy. It's vulnerability. It's not cynicism. It's forgiveness. That is what the gospel is. That is what Jesus lived. And here's where most sermons stop. Most sermons, well, not most sermons necessarily in our circles, but most sermons out in the world in the evangelical movement stop with God is love and God is, he he cares for you and he accepts you. And I want to say before we move on, we can look at that and say, oh, that's so wishy-washy, all that love stuff. We need to, like, get the practical. Let's do this. You know what? We need both. And far too often, we miss that. We miss the love stuff, and we try and do it in our own power, and we make it all about the rules, and that doesn't work either. We need the love before it can change our lives. But are we going to stop with just knowing that God loves us and accepts us, or does it keep going from there? I want to ask you a question. Because if we believe in a God who loves us more than anything in the world, if we believe in that kind of a God, can we live our lives the same way? The gospel is impossible not just because of God's love that loved us and went to impossible depths for us, but because it calls us to go to impossible heights for him. That's what makes it impossible. Not just that God went to the very depths because he loved us, but because he then calls us to go to impossible heights for him. If the gospel is really love, selflessness, humility, vulnerability, forgiveness, grace, wouldn't we, the people who believe it, be the people who live it out most powerfully? Wouldn't that make sense? If we really believe that, isn't that what our lives are going to become? Yeah, And I get what your mind's probably doing right now. I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to live that. I don't, how am I supposed to do that? But I have a question. If we really believe the gospel, if we really believe the gospel, do we know any way not to do that? Do we have any excuse not to actually live it out? If we believe it with our heads and we're like, yeah, all of that stuff is probably true, but I don't know if I really believe it then we're not going to live it. But if we really determine to believe that, to believe in that kind of a God, if we really believe that, we have to live it out. It will become a part of us, and it will become who we are on a day-to-day basis. But somehow in our minds, that's impossible, if we're really honest. We might think, well, it might be possible for other people, but not me. See, it, and I get that because, believe it or not, I've spent a lot of time over the last year arguing with God about how I think some of the things he's asking are impossible. That's not something I'm proud of, but it's something that's real in my experience. And I can go to God over and over again and say, but God, it's impossible. There is no way. I can't do that. It's it's not that I don't want to. It's just I, I can't. And God's like, yeah, you can't, but I can. Hello, that's what it's all about. We try to handle things alone and in our own power and in our own strength. And you know what? It doesn't ever work. You could talk to my friends and they could probably tell you that my biggest fault is trying to do things alone instead of going to Jesus with those problems. Trying to figure things out myself, trying to do everything right in my own strength, but not going to him and letting him do it. See, the thing with the gospel is it's not about that. It's not about how hard we try. We come to family retreat every year, and I don't just mean you guys. I mean us, too, because as much as I 
there's this barrier that can tend to be put between you down there and whoever is speaking up here. And let me tell you, I know I say this every year, but I want to say it this year stronger than I've ever said it before. There's no barrier between you guys down there and us up here. We are exactly the same as you. And if you knew everything that went on in our heads, you would be like, yeah, I totally agree. You are the same as us. Now, you can't see inside of our heads, and we can't see inside of yours, but God can. And he knows that we're just the same as you. Me, all the rest of the speakers who are going to be speaking this week, we have our own struggles too, and we need the power of the gospel just as much as you do. You know, earlier, well, actually, I guess it was last year now. You know how quickly time flies. But um, I guess it was last um, October. I was processing a lot of different things, and I had unfortunately allowed some of those things to come in between me and my relationship with God. I wasn't talking to him about it as much as I should be. I wasn't giving it to him as much as I wanted to be, and I was letting it frustrate me and separate me from him to some degree. And I recognized that, and I was like, God, this can't carry on anymore. I need to deal with this with you, not just me. And I want you involved in every last little piece of this picture. And you know sometimes when we tell God something like that and then he asks us to do something and we're like, uh, I didn't quite mean that. Well, as I was telling God that, he put this little idea in my head. And at first I was like, no, that's crazy. It wasn't that I didn't want to do it. It's just that it seemed so crazy it didn't seem like a good idea. And I'll tell you, the idea that he put in my mind was to ask my family. We only have one car. And so this was part of why the idea seemed so crazy to me. But I knew I really needed some quality time to just be me and God. You know, we can be us and God at church, but that's kind of with a whole congregation of other people. We can be us and God in family worship, and that's good too, but that's again with more people. And sometimes we need to be just us and Jesus to actually talk to him. You know, we see Jesus did that a lot in his life. And so God put this idea in my head. We live about five hours from Banff National Park to ask my family if I could use the car for a couple days and go to Banff on my own and take some time to pray. Now, I want to encourage you 10-year-olds, 15-year-olds, if you're thinking God's giving you that idea, it's probably not God because you'd probably crash the car on the way there or end up in, you know, a restaurant or something, not spending time out in nature praying. So I'm not trying to give you all a bunch of wacky ideas. But for me in this particular situation, God put on my heart that I needed to go and take a couple of days away from absolutely everything because Banff National Park is in Canada. It also means there's no cell reception up there, no internet. So I was really going to be removed from any kind of distraction in any form, especially because I was going to be there without my family. And so when God put, first put this idea in my head, I was like, that is ridiculous. For a start off, I can't leave my family with no car. Secondly, uh, do you think my parents are going to want me wandering around a national park on my own, like bears, mountain lions? No, I don't think so. So I was like, I'd love to do that, God, but it's not practical, and it's going to look really ridiculous. I mean, what 21-year-old just goes off and stays in a hotel and goes to a national park and prays for three days? Like, that's weird. Well, God wasn't quite done that easy. And so he kept putting this thought in my mind, and because I really did want to spend this time with him, I finally was like, okay, fine, I'll do my part, and I'll suggest the idea to my parents, and when they say no, then that's fine, I did my part. <laughs> well, they didn't say no, they were like, yeah, that's fine, you can do that, and I was like, seriously? And so, by after that point, I was like, okay, you know what, this is definitely God, obviously what God wants me to do, and I'm really excited about this. And so, I went, I was trying to make the trip, trip very cheap, and so I ended up staying in a hotel in Calgary, which was about an hour and a half from the park. FYI, if you ever go to Banff, don't do that. It's a long way away. It's a real pain, and driving in Canada is a little bit different. It's not that much, but it was enough to throw me off. Um, and so I go up there, and I have these three days to just spend me and God, no self-service, no anything else. Do you think that was comfortable? Do you think every minute of those three days I was like, oh, this is amazing? Well, no, especially not because the whole reason I was there was to talk through some things with God that I didn't really want to think about. That definitely didn't help to make it comfortable for my natural, for my natural desires. But do you know, sometimes we have to do things that aren't necessarily 100% comfortable for us, and those are the things that are for our best good. You know, all throughout those few days that I was there, I could see God giving me little evidences that he was in this because I was trying to keep this trip very economical. I didn't really want to spend money. And so I'm driving up there, and I go to pass through the border. And since we don't have a pass for Canada, it was supposed to be about $50 to get a park pass for, like, three days. So I drive up to the border. I have my money ready, and they're like, 
oh, it's the 150th year of, um, I don't know if it was Banff or just Canadian National Park. So for the next two months, we're giving out free passes. People can go to the park for free for the next two months. I was like, I saw that. Thank you, God. And then my, my phone was trying to work with navigation offline, and I didn't quite save the location, so then I wasn't figuring out how to get to them. So I really needed to go to a grocery store to get something to eat for the next few days. But I was so exhausted by the time I got to where my hotel was in the evening that I was just like, I have no internet. I can't figure out how to get where I'm going. So never mind. We'll just, we'll just skip that. Well, lo and behold, right next to my hotel, like in the parking lot of my hotel, was exactly the store I needed to get the food I needed. I was like, well, thank you, God. And there was numerous things like that throughout that weekend. Numerous things and time that I would spend just going to the edge of the lake and sitting there and talking to God about those things that I needed to talk about in my life. And not always was that pleasant. Not always was that clear and I could see everything that God was wanting me to understand. I couldn't always do that. But God knew that's exactly what I needed to do at that point. When Jesus asks us to live out the gospel, he never asks us to do it alone. That's the point. The point is that, yeah, he may ask us to do radical things for him, but he gives us a radical faith to do those things, and he comes with us. That's what really matters. It's not that we live out the gospel. It's that he does, and that's what really counts. I want us to turn our Bibles to Romans chapter 8. This is a chapter that I listened to over and over again when I was in Banff that week and many times since then as I was driving um, in the National Park. I would listen to this chapter um, over and over, and if there's ever a chapter that shows the power of the gospel, I think it's this. Romans chapter 8, starting, we're going to skip around, um, starting with verse 1. It says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. If we really let that sink in, we'd realize that it's not about us. It's not about our efforts. It's not about whether we're perfect or not. It's about him and letting him transform us, letting him change us. We're going to carry on reading more of Romans 8 a little bit later, but... God does not ask us to navigate the valley of the shadow of death alone. He doesn't ask us to keep our ship afloat on a storming sea. He just asks us to let him come with us. That's what he asks. You know what I'm learning that looks like? It looks like taking the high road in everything. And I've thought about this term a lot because the high road kind of sounds like this high and mighty proud I'm taking the high road kind of thing. But in my mind, what the high road really means, and really you could call it the narrow way, what it really means is when we're presented with a situation, with a circumstance that seems impossible, with a person that seems impossible, with a crisis or something like that that seems impossible, you know what the high road does? It says, I'm going to hang on to Jesus, and I'm going to surmount this impossibility because he is faithful enough to surmount this impossibility through me and in me. That looks like forgiving the people who hurt us. That can seem like a huge impossibility. We can look at, you know, situations, where maybe that's relationships, whatever that is, and think, it's impossible for me to forgive them. It's impossible for me to move on from that situation. It's not impossible to, for us to forgive. And if we really believe the gospel, we will forgive. We'll forgive again and again and again. Does that mean that what the person did wasn't wrong? Does that mean they even maybe said sorry? Maybe they didn't. I was, I was talking to God about this just a few weeks ago, and I was like, so what does forgiveness actually look like? What does it actually mean? What if the person doesn't say sorry? Can we still forgive? And God was like, well, when the, you know, the soldiers were nailing the hammers, in, or the, nailing the hammers, hammering the nails into my hands, that they said sorry? I was like, uh, no, not exactly. Does that mean that what they were doing was right now that Jesus forgave them, it was okay? No, it's not okay. Sin is never, ever, ever okay. And forgiveness does not make sin okay. Forgiveness is us simply choosing to say, I'm not going to hold a grudge. I'm not going to hold up myself against this. I'm going to love like Jesus loves. Now, that doesn't mean that we remove the responsibility of sin. Sin has consequences, and that's not for us to take away. 
But forgiveness is just our willingness to say, God, I leave this in your hands. I will do what you are asking me to do instead of acting on my anger or acting on my desire to cower under the situation. I'm going to follow you, and I'm going to do what you ask. That's what the gospel looks like. It looks like loving people like Jesus does, even when that's uncomfortable. You know, far too often as Christians, we claim that we love Jesus, and yet far too often we can be known as judgmental, unloving, unforgiving, divisive people. You know that's true? Far too often, church can be seen as that's where you go if you want all kinds of problems and all kinds of issues. And it's true. No church is without their issues. No church is without its problems. But is that what we're supposed to be like as Christians? Are we supposed to be setting ourselves up to judge other people, setting ourselves up to criticize other people? Is that what we're supposed to live like? No. Our family was, we were driving here um, on Sabbath, and we passed a guy on the side of the road who was holding a sign that says homeless. And it was very cold outside. It was about 25, but the wind was even colder. And you know when you pass these people on the road, and it's just awkward to stop. It's like, I, there's traffic behind me. Like, I can't just stop. Well, I, growing up, have always, when I see those kind of people, you know, I haven't always said, hey, Dad, let's stop and give something to these people. But praise the Lord, I started to do that on Sabbath. When I saw this man, I was like, I, we need to do something for him. And we couldn't, we didn't end up stopping. We pulled into the gas station that was right across the street. And, well, it wasn't a street. It was the interstate. And so we got there, and I was like, I want to go give him a glow track and some food that we have and stuff. And uh, my brother came with me. Of course, it's, you know, we're walking across the interstate. So we walk over there and um, give this guy, you know, some, some money and some food and a glow track. And it's a simple thing. And yet far too often, we see those people and we think, oh, they're probably faking, you know. I had another experience just this last summer um, where I was in town alone driving. And I saw a guy on the side of the road with a sign. And um, my first reaction was, let me drive past him. And that's appalling. That was my first reaction. But it was. And the Holy Spirit kept putting in my mind, why are you doing this? You have no excuse. You're the one driving the car. Because sometimes my excuse can be, well, maybe my parents didn't see him, and I don't want to speak up because, you know, we're busy. And Jesus is like, no, you're driving the car. <laughs> this is all on you. And so I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So where I was by this point, I had passed the guy, long passed him. And to get back to him was going to take me about five minutes just because of the way the traffic was. But I decided to go back, and so I went back, and by the time I got there, he wasn't stood with his sign anymore. He's now sitting in the Starbucks, um, the tables outside of Starbucks, without, you know, with his sign sitting down by the table. Well, you think it's awkward to walk up to someone on the side of the street. It's a whole lot more awkward to walk up to someone in a, who's sitting at a, you know, table and say, hey, I saw your sign, I saw you five minutes ago, and it's a little more awkward. But God was like, you know what you need to do, and so I did. And the guy had a heartbreaking story. And I talked to him for maybe 10 minutes, prayed with him, gave him $10, and I washed him out the corner of my eyes as I left. And as soon as I left, he went into Starbucks to get himself something to eat. I don't think he had any money. And sure, we can look at those situations and say, yeah, well, you know, you have no idea. He could have been lying. He could have been. I really don't care if he was lying. The point was that we treat them like Jesus. And that's the point with people in general. They might be lying. People might be, you know, speaking in a way that's not right to us. They might be lying. They may not be going through the stuff that they might look like they are. But does that really matter? Or does it matter that we treat them like Jesus? That's what the gospel is about. The gospel looks like humility. And this one cuts close to all of us, but it looks like being willing to say, I'm sorry. Being willing to admit that I am not always right. And you're not always right. And you're not always going to, things may not always be from the side that you see them. It looks like being vulnerable. It looks like taking responsibility for our sin when we mess up. It looks like not telling the rest of the world that we have it together, but being willing to say, yeah, I'm struggling too. The gospel looks like living like Jesus in our day-to-day -day lives. And when we come up against an impossibility saying, God, you are greater this, than this impossibility because the truth that you have is stronger than anything that I will ever meet in my life. And here's the thing. When we really believe the gospel, and I mean really, where once we saw a mountain, now we see a path through. And maybe we don't always see that path through, but we know it's there. And it's Jesus. 
Our circumstances may not change. You might be in a situation where your circumstances are just plain hard, and you've prayed, and you've prayed, and you've prayed, God change it, God change it, and God doesn't change it. Does that mean it's impossible? No, it just means that Jesus is going to walk through it with you, and that makes absolutely everything and anything possible. I often think about people who are in prison for their faith in God. I mean, it can't get a whole lot worse than that. And yet they were happy. And it's a rebuke to me when I think, oh, God, I can't do it. It's impossible. And he's like, what about the guy in jail? Is that impossible? It looks it, but it's not with Jesus. If we're dealing with loneliness, Jesus will be that answer. Does that mean that we won't be lonely anymore? Not necessarily, but it means that he will walk through it with us. If we're dealing with depression, and um, my first reaction was, let me drive past him. And that's appalling. That was my first reaction, but it was. And the Holy Spirit kept putting in my mind, why are you doing this? You have no excuse. You're the one driving the car. Because sometimes my excuse can be, well, maybe my parents didn't see him, and I don't want to speak up because, you know, we're busy. And Jesus is like, no, you're driving the car. (laughs) This is all on you. And so I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So where I was by this point, I had passed the guy, long passed him. And to get back to him was going to take me about five minutes just because of the way the traffic was. But I decided to go back, and so I went back, and by the time I got there, he wasn't stood with his sign anymore. He's now sitting in the Starbucks, um, the tables outside of Starbucks, without, you know, with his sign sitting down by the table. Well, you think it's awkward to walk up to someone on the side of the street. It's a whole lot more awkward to walk up to someone in a, who's sitting at a, you know, table and say, hey, I saw your sign, I saw you five minutes ago, and it's a little more awkward. But God was like, you know what you need to do. And so I did, and the guy had a heartbreaking story. And I talked to him for maybe 10 minutes, prayed with him, gave him $10, and I washed him out the corner of my eyes as I left. And as soon as I left, he went into Starbucks to get himself something to eat. I don't think he had any money. And sure, we can look at those situations and say, yeah, well, you know, you have no idea. He could have been lying. He could have been. I really don't care if he was lying. The point was that we treat them like Jesus. And that's the point with people in general. They might be lying. People might be, you know, speaking in a way that's not right to us. They might be lying. They may not be going through the stuff that they might look like they are. But does that really matter? Or does it matter that we treat them like Jesus? That's what the gospel is about. The gospel looks like humility. And this one cuts close to all of us, but it looks like being willing to say, I'm sorry. Being willing to admit that I am not always right. And you're not always right. And you're not always going to, things may not always be from the side that you see them. It looks like being vulnerable. It looks like taking responsibility for our sin when we mess up. It looks like not telling the rest of the world that we have it together, but being willing to say, yeah, I'm struggling too. The gospel looks like living like Jesus in our day-to-day lives. And when we come up against an impossibility saying, God, You are greater than this impossibility because the truth that you have is stronger than anything that I will ever meet in my life. And here's the thing. When we really believe the gospel, and I mean really, where once we saw a mountain, now we see a path through. And maybe we don't always see that path through, but we know it's there. And it's Jesus. Our circumstances may not change. You might be in a situation where your circumstances are just plain hard, and you've prayed, and you've prayed, and you've prayed, God change it, God change it, and God doesn't change it. Does that mean it's impossible? No, it just means that Jesus is going to walk through it with you, and that makes absolutely everything and anything possible. I often think about people who are in prison for their faith in God. I mean, it can't get a whole lot worse than that. And yet they were happy. And it's a rebuke to me when I think, oh, God, I can't do it, it's impossible. And he's like, what about the guy in jail? Is that impossible? It looks it, but it's not with Jesus. If we're dealing with loneliness, Jesus will be that answer. Does that mean that we won't be lonely anymore? Not necessarily, but it means that he will walk through it with us. If we're dealing with depression, Jesus will be that for us too. If we're dealing with circumstances we can't change, Jesus will be the answer. It doesn't mean he'll fix it. It doesn't mean it'll all go away. And we're going to talk about that Sabbath morning, about how God works in our pain and things like that. But He'll stand with us in the middle of the struggle. Maybe it's relationships you can't heal, health issues you can't recover from. God is there, and he is the one who makes these things possible. Does he always make it better? No. But does he turn impossibility into possibility? Always. I want to address one more thing before we close, and that is, does taking the high road mean that we never fall? Does the gospel mean that we never make a mistake? 
Well, if you've had any experience trying to live the gospel, you probably know the answer is no, because we do fall. We do make mistakes. We don't always live out what we believe the gospel to be. And we can, we can have a dim idea of who Jesus is and try and still mess up and still do it wrong. We can actually love God with all of our hearts and yet still end up failing him. It's not always going to be like that because we're growing and we're learning in him. But I was talking to God about this uh, a couple of months ago and about how I want to just have everything together and have my little life perfect right now. And I was asking him, like, how does that fit into the fact that we're obviously supposed to be perfect in him, but at this point, I'm definitely not. And he was reminding me of the fact that it's a ladder. It's a ladder of progression. And when we give our hearts to God, Jesus doesn't take, uh, just like if there was a ladder, you know, up one of these walls, a little child doesn't drop from the bottom rung of the ladder all the way to the top. It's impossible. God doesn't expect us when we give our heart to him to jump from the very bottom rung all the way to the top rung right there and then. If he did, we could say, I surrender all, and then we'd all be translated. But it doesn't work like that. It's progress. It takes time. And in progress, oftentimes we fall. And yet this is the beautiful thing about the gospel. And this is something that I have learned in my own experience in the last year. And I want to, I can't emphasize this too much. When we fall, God does not let go of us. Even when we think I've messed up too bad this time, maybe it's not something we've done. Maybe it's just that we've gotten so confused and we don't know what we believe and everything's a blur. And we're like, God, it's this time. It's too much. I, I've let myself slide too much. And this time you can't do anything. God looks down and he's like, yeah, actually, I still can, and I still will. And even when you tell me that I don't want you, I'm going to keep chasing you just to be really sure that you mean that because I'm not going to give up on you just because you said it once. I'm not going to stop and let you do your own thing just because once you decided that you wanted to. We can be afraid that we're going to walk and that God's going to be like, enough is enough. God will not do that until he is 100% sure that nothing he does will ever change your heart. God is never going to leave us until we are absolutely determined that we want nothing to do with him and he can't change us. And, you know, I don't think any of us are there right now. And I pray none of us ever get there. When we fall, God picks us back up. And sometimes we don't see that in our fall. We just see ourselves. But he does every time. I want to tell you a quick story. Um, A story that I, I think I told my family this story. I didn't want to worry them. And so if I did tell them, I didn't tell them for a long time after it happened. But this last um, summer, I was taking a day, and it seems like all my stories are centered on this today, but I was taking a day to be in Glacier National Park, and again, just be still and just pray and talk to God. Now, Glacier's only about an hour and a half away from us, so that's not quite as crazy as driving to Canada. But anyway, I was sitting by the, in Glacier National Park, there's kind of like a not a river, but not a stream. It's, it can be a raging torrent in the spring and that's when, or in the early summer. And that's when I was there. And so I was sitting on the edge of this raging torrent with a rocky bottom. It's kind of like waterfalls all the way down. And I was praying and I was wrestling with some things in my life and just feeling like I'm not getting through to God and I'm not getting anywhere. And he was trying to reassure me of how loving he is. I, I wasn't getting it. And so finally I finished praying and I stand up and I wanted to take a picture. I don't know who started this trend? It might have been my brother, but of taking a picture of your surroundings with your feet in the picture to give a perspective. You've probably all seen our pictures on Instagram like that. So I was trying to take a picture of this because this raging river was so cool. And I was like, this would be even more cool if I took off my flip-flops and just stand with my bare feet. I wasn't thinking incredibly straight, I guess. And the rock I was stood on was a great big rock that was perfectly smooth and slanted down straight into the waterfall. And you probably know where this is going by now. And so I, you know, taking the pictures of my flip-flops. I'm like, okay, take them off, stand on the rock. And I'm using my brother's Canon 5D, kind of adds to the the story. Um, And I'm like, okay, take a picture. Ooh, let's slide on this rock. And I still don't know what, well, I do know what happened. I slid on the rock, and the rock was perfectly smooth, straight into the waterfall. But amazingly, I slid, and I just fell right there, and I didn't move an inch. And I'm sitting there, like, with the water around me. My first thought was, the camera. The camera was fine, praise the Lord. I was fine. I was very wet. But I realized in that moment, first of all, I was like, okay, um, I should be more careful, especially when I'm out alone. And that's why I didn't tell my family about this story for a little while, because I was like, they don't need that stress. 
Um, maybe I should have told them sooner. I don't know, but I don't like to worry them more than I have to. What I realized, first of all, was I could have ended up in that waterfall. And I, I may not have died, but it wouldn't have been pretty, especially with nobody there to get me out. But what I realized was what I had just been praying about for the last hour on the shore was that I didn't feel like I could, I could be what God wanted me to be. And he kept telling me, I'm here for you and I love you and I'm going to be there for you. And it took me falling into the, or almost falling into this waterfall for him to be like, hello, see, I am here. I just saved you. Do you get it now? Do you get it now that no matter how many times you fall and do something stupid and then fall and could be in great danger because of it, I'm still going to get you. I'm still going to catch you. The verse, it's in the Old Testament somewhere. It says, and underneath are the everlasting arms. It's true. You may fall. The righteous man falls seven times. You may fall, but when you fall, you fall into his arms. And if you hang on to him, you will rise again. The righteous man falls seven times, but he rises again. The wicked fall once, and they rise no more. As a good friend of mine likes to remind me of this verse over and over when I forget this verse over and over, which is why I need the reminder over and over. The righteous fall, but they always get back up. That's the difference. God always lifts us up if we're willing to let him. The gospel always changes our lives if we're willing to let it. In closing, I want to tell you a story of a family in India there were Welsh missionaries who went to India, and they were working with this little village and with the town, and there was a family in that village who decided to give their lives completely to God. They were the first family of converts in the village, and they give their lives to God. And I don't know how quickly it was after they were converted, but it wasn't very long. And the village chief calls them out into the city center, and he says to the husband, he says, if you will not renounce your faith in Jesus... I will kill your family right before your eyes. And the man says, I have decided to follow Jesus. There is no turning back. And without getting graphic, right there and then, the chief kills the man's two sons right in front of his eyes. And he says, okay, now I ask you again. Are you going to give up on this? And the man says, the world's behind me. The cross is before me. There is no turning back. And right there and then, they kill his wife in front of him. And then they say, okay, you have one more chance are you going to give up this crazy belief? Or do you want us to do to you what we just did to your family? And the man says, though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back. And they kill him. But see, we could say, what an impossibility. How crazy that it ended there. It didn't end there. The whole village ended up coming to God because of what they saw in that family that day. The whole village became Christian. And the chief who ordered the men to kill that family became Christian because of their faith. You may think you're facing an impossibility. You may not see the other side of the story. You may not know what you believe. You may have fallen so many times you don't think you can get back up. But faith makes it possible. This gospel makes it possible no matter what you're dealing with. I want us to look at the last few verses of Romans 8. Verse 35 to the end, it says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And I want you to think about each one of these things. Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors. How? Through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, unless we didn't cover something in all of those things, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Even you aren't powerful enough to separate you from God. Even your horrible circumstances aren't enough to separate you from God. Nothing is enough to separate you from God the only thing that can separate you from God is if you turn your back on him because he's not going to force you. That's the only thing. The gospel is so powerful that it will change our lives. And when we live it, when really, we really live the gospel, it will do amazing things. You know, you ask, is the gospel powerful enough to change me and to change the world? I ask, have you ever really known the gospel? Because when you do, it can't help changing you and the world through you. In closing, I'm going to invite Caleb up, and we're going to sing a song that has become one of both of our favorites. Um, 
For His Glory isn't here this year, but it's a song that we listen to of theirs over and over when we're in the car, and we'll sing it together. Because what we've been talking about, that gospel, that's what this song represents. darkness fills the night it cannot hide the light whom shall I fear I know who goes before me I know who stands behind the God of angel armies is always by my side the one who reigns forever he is a friend of mine the god of angel armies is always by my side you crush the enemy underneath my feet you are my sword and shield the troubles linger still my strength is in your name for you alone can say you will deliver me yours is the victory whom shall shall stand you hold the whole world in your hands I'm holding on to your promises you are faithful faithful I know who goes before me I know who stands behind the God of angel armies is always by my side the one who reigns forever he is a friend of mine the God of angel armies is always by my We're going to take a couple minutes for reflection and prayer time, and then we're going to close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gospel that you've given us. We thank you for the power that it gives us, even in situations that we think might be impossible. Even in situations like writing a sermon last minute that might have felt impossible to me at some points. You always answer, and maybe you don't answer in the way that we think you should answer. Maybe you just answer with your presence, not with a solution. Help us to be content with that. Help us to be content with you, and then you can give whatever you give in whatever time you know is best. But help us to recognize that you are the answer, and that that's enough for us. In Jesus' name, 